Good afternoon and welcome all to this final installment of our Conversations for a Centenary. Today's subject is Jean de Monsieur and Marcel Dupre through the lens of two very special guests, Jeremy Filsell and Stephen Tharp. The conversation will be moderated by Joy Leilani Garbutt. My name is Vince Carr, the National Council for Education, and it is an honor to welcome you on behalf of the Committee on Continuing Professional Education, which is led by Frank Crozio. A few words about our session today, which is a webinar format on Zoom. Our presentation will last around 40 minutes and will be followed by a question and answer session. You may submit your question by accessing the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen to the right of center. You do not need to wait until the Q&A session begins to post your questions, so feel free to post them throughout the webinar as they come to you. We will try our best to answer all the questions submitted. However, those questions we cannot answer due to time constraints, we will have the presenter answer following the webinar. Without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Joy Leilani Garbutt. Thank you so much, Vince, and thank you to the AGO for organizing these, these wonderful educational events. Um, this year, we have the great honor of commemorating two towering figures of the French organ world. The first, Marcel Dupre, composer, teacher, performer, director of the Paris Conservatoire, titular of Saint-Sulpice, who died 50 years ago this year, and the other, Jean Demassou, also renowned organist, composer, teacher, performer, titular of La Madeleine and whose birth was a hundred years ago. It is a delight to be joined by two formidable musicians, Dr. Jeremy Philsell, a Dupre scholar and director of music at St. Thomas Fifth Avenue in New York and renowned international concert organist and recording artist and Demacy specialist, Stephen Tharps. Thank you so much for being with us today. Pleasure. I wanted to begin with the music of Dupre and uh, as, as we know, he wrote quite a lot of organ music, which Jeremy has wonderfully guided us through this past year with concerts of the complete works of Dupre from St. Thomas. But Jeremy, I'm wondering if you can give us, for those that may not be as familiar with his complete uh, compositional output, uh, an overview to the organ music of Marcel Dupre. You said we've only got 40 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and condense it into four. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, Dupre, I think, was, a, was, was um, an extraordinary musician, a chameleon, a magpie, um, able to turn his hand to uh, musical feats uh, compositionally as a performer, as an improviser, at the drop of a hat. Um, just a remarkably complete musician. Um, his music is, of course, the, the primary legacy we have, although he lived through a recording age, of course, so we do have recordings of him playing. Um, that attests to his particular brand of, of interpretive uh, sort of skill and aesthetic. Um, but of course, it is the, it is the compositional legacy uh, that future generations are and, and, and will judge him on. And I think that reveals the uh, breadth of his uh, musical art. Um, of course, from the 1920s onwards, he devoted himself to the organ, having written song cycles, having written chamber music, um, and indeed orchestral music. Um, and at the time, you know, there was a chance that he might make the piano his first love, um, encouraged as he was at the conservatoire. Uh, but of course he devoted himself, fell in love with the instrument, the organ, and devoted himself to that uh, thereon. So we have um, an extraordinary legacy of music written for our instrument that really traverses um, an incredible range from the concert music um, of the highest virtuoso order, everybody knows the Preludes and Fugues Opus 7, which really launched Dupre's career, but throughout his, um, his, his oeuvre are works just as grand and as, uh, as impressive in stature as the Opus 7 Preludes and Fugues. But that is just one aspect of his art. Of course, he was, for his life, a liturgical musician as well, and spent most of those years in the, the rear gallery of Saint Sulpice accompanying liturgy. So his immersion in Gregorian chant from an early age um, as an organist and um, church musician 
uh, influenced, uh, as it did all those organists of that generation, um, his music profoundly. And so his liturgical music, I think, is of, of, of real uh, value. The short Gregorian preludes, the, um, the antiem uh, that he wrote, antiphons for Christmas, um, Le Tombeau de Titulus, uh, the list is pretty extensive of liturgical music. And then, of course, because he spent virtually all his career as a teacher too, the pedagogical works are of huge importance. Um, the invention, the 79 chorales for the, for the early uh, beginning organist, through to what we know were the, the, the deux études he wrote for de Messieurs, which were never published in the um, entirety. But we know that um, some of those, some of that music found its way into other things that have um, an esquisse étude like uh, countenance. Um, the inventions of his 50 are wonderful pedagogical works that really, rather like the Chopin um, etudes, really venture into poetic territory, in my opinion. Um, they're not just pedagogical works. But the point is, he was um, an extraordinarily broad musician and, and his musical aesthetic reached into all those places that many others didn't reach. That's the, the truth of it, I think. Thank you for, for that and for helping to distinguish these categories of, of compositions that we can use to guide our, our understanding of his. Um, you mentioned the inventions and I believe it's difficult to talk about music without hearing some of it. And I think we have a, a brief clip to play of one of the inventions. Lovely. And can, can you tell us just a word or two about that specific invention, what we just heard? Yeah, well, it, 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 it's the first in C major, and, and uh, of course he wrote 24 in each key, uh, each major and minor key. Um, and they are all of that kind of length, um, little imitative counterpoints, canons, uh, Ricciacare's mini, in min, miniature form. So all those inventions, they're all two pages, sometimes three. Um, but all done and dusted in a minute. And they're, they're little microcosmic snapshots of everything that Dupre wrote on, on a grander scale. Um, and so many of them are like that. Um, inventions that you can hear the Bachian pedigree, they sound like the two or three part inventions of Bach, um, all that sort of imitative interweaving uh, counterpoint, but with a, you know, a, a slightly spicier 20th century harmonic edge. Um, but I mean, the, all those inventions, which he wrote in the, in the mid 1950s when he was director of Paris Conservatoire, they're the only things that he wrote. Um, and uh, he famously said that, of course, his two years as director of the Paris Conservatoire before his retirement was a, was a preview of purgatory, um, dealing with all the administrative uh, shenanigans of intractable professors and, and, and so on. Uh, and there wasn't much music. And, and the only uh, creative products of that short period were these inventions. And they are a wonderful little um, snapshot, as I say, of, of everything else that Dupre wrote. Um, they're wonderful, uh, not just from a, a, a technical point of view, but from, a, from an intellectual point of view as well. They, they, they're, they're piquant challenges, I always think, and well worth investigating. Wonderful. Um, we have one other excerpt that you've sent us from the Cortege and Litany. And before we play that, I'm wondering if you might just give a, a brief introduction. We'll be able to play just a little from the beginning and then about the last minute and a half to share with people. So for those who aren't already familiar with this wonderful work, can you just introduce us to it before we hear an excerpt? Sure, it's, 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 it's always a bit curious to me that this is such a popular work. Um, uh, it, it's not entirely representative of Dupre, but he, he wrote it originally uh, um, for a chamber group um, as the incidental music to a short play. 
um, but he was encouraged to to uh, to write it for for piano for keyboard, and then uh, Alexander Russell, of course, his agent in in the U.S., uh, persuaded him to to rewrite it again as an organ work. Um, it's typical of Dupre in that there are two themes: there's a cortege theme at the beginning, which then becomes interposed on the on the, the litany um, of repeated notes later on, and that kind of interlocking of thematic ideas is so typically uh, Dupre, but it's a very um, strong sort of diptyque, you know, in two very distinct parts. And of course, it, it, it develops from pianissimo through to, to fortissimo. So I suppose it has that, um, that great sweep to it. Um, but it's, uh, it's proved to be one of his most enduring um, works ag against type, I would say, but um, nonetheless, there it is. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. And let's go ahead and have that excerpt.
Thank you for sharing that with us, Jeremy. Thrilling playing an instrument in space, and I'm glad that we got to, to see that. Thank you. I should should say that if you thought that people weren't interested in Dupre from the, 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 the great crowds there, because that was back in January when we were only allowed, um, we weren't allowed an audience at all, so that was behind closed doors, and we were allowed to invite sort of a handful of people who were on the inside, as it were, to come and sit there and listen to it live. <laughs> I'm glad that's not an indication of, of yeah. musical interest in Dupre. Slightly songs. worrying, really. <laughs> Um, well, I'd like to, to move now a little bit to the music, not a little bit, but to turn now to the music of Demisieu. And I know that it has a reputation for being fiendishly difficult. And I fear that sometimes the conversations about her compositions stop there and don't go much further beyond that. Stephen, as one of the, the people unique in the world to play all of her music, I wonder if you can give us the, the five minute overview of besides difficult, what else is there about her music and why should we study it and learn it? Well, one thing to remember is uh, she, as she composed, proved to have an extremely individual language that uh, being, she's a person whose career was built as this incredible virtuoso performer. And with uh, most of what we understand of her as a musician being uh, stories of performances and the recordings of music of other people that she made, um, there wasn't a lot of talk about uh, much of her output, except for something of such legendary status as the Cissé Dude, that it's kind of assumed that this this virtuoso was writing a lot of music mostly for herself. That was music that she would master, and at the time probably was the first uh, and one of very few to, but certainly not the only. But we weren't talking about that because we didn't really know much about much of this music until later. Um, we have to remember, uh, while the, her output was so much smaller than Dupre because she died so young, uh, she did write more than 30 compositions and only a third of those are organ music. And some of those until very recently were never even published. So other than the legendary stories of the most fiendish things, uh, there wasn't a lot to circulate or to go to hear or, or to buy in the way of recording of her music. Uh, people who heard her live talked of her performing her music. Um, and interestingly enough, she only played all six of her etudes once in her life and that's when she premiered them. Concerts would occasionally have one or two selected, but not the entirety of it. Um, so she did tour with select movements from some of her other uh, uh, bigger compositions, um, but rarely played them as in their entirety in, in recital. And so uh, at best, you're getting a sampling of only certain music had you had the chance to hear her, or eventually as these pieces were published, other people play them, but during her relatively short life and compositional career, there was very little to see. And I think it was so overshadowed by all this playing uh, that got so much attention that, that that's part of the reason. But there is everything spanning the gamut. There is concert music to religious music, uh, um, horrifically technically demanding music, even when it's not fast, just because of the way the counterpoint unfolds to the wonderful uh, 12 chorale preludes that commissioned by McLaughlin and Riley in the US in 1950 and geared specifically for an American audience. And because they're all based on plain chant, the intention was to use them for the liturgy rather than concert. And if you wanted an introduction to her music that wasn't the hardest thing to grasp, um, technically it was music like that in her on Dante, uh, composed in 1953 as part of 64 Lessons in Harmony, uh, a volume of 64 composers, each dedicating a piece to uh, Jean Gaillon, Gaillon uh, the harmony teacher she had. And in only those two pages is this incredible lesson in the movement of harmony and the movement of counterpoint. Um, I had a chance to play this in Europe about two months ago in Hamburg. And uh, it's three minutes of, of, of music that is not that technically demanding at all, sandwiched between the Te Deum on one side and the Etudes on the other. And of the organists who came and were somewhat familiar with her output, they found the most moving thing of that whole sequence to be this andante. They didn't know it. And it said, what a lesson this is on so many levels in these simple two pages and how Composing for her on that scale was uh, the, the, the foundation for all of this incredible virtuosity in, in her compositions later, but even the simplest things had such meaning and layers and integrity to it. You have to remember that this is a very prodigious young pianist who entered the Paris Conservatoire at age 12 
and was a piano student before entering Dupre's class at age 15 and finished her studies with all kinds of first prizes and then continued to work privately after that with Dupre um, during the war years when she composed some of these incredible pieces while living essentially in the subway of the, of the Paris Metro trying to avoid bombings. So the temperament, even in simple pieces like Nativité, which is scored for these very exotic registrations, Voix Humain, Mutations Moving in the Pedal, it's sort of her first piece from 19, uh, 1943-1944, um, was one opus before the Etudes, which she hailed out at the Sal Playel and just blew everybody away. And I guess there was a quote after the premiere that Durifle said to a group of people, well, we all play the pedals like elephants compared to her. Um, but this is also uh, the consequences of practicing 10 or 11 hours a day for years. And you should have something like that, I would hope to show for it. But um, after that, you have the seven meditations on the, on the Holy Spirit. You have uh, a wonderful C major prelude in fugue, which is a fabulous example of something she did uh, as a composer was to take a small cell at the beginning. In this case, it's uh, the Lydian scale transposed to C. So you have the C major with the F sharp and there's a five note motive in the beginning of which little fragments are taken and strewn out and transposed and so forth as sort of landmark points throughout the composition to give it a sort of unity. And she did that all the time. And that's a textbook classic example. The uh, wonderful Triptyque Opus 7, which is the opus directly after the Etudes, very Dupre in its character, given the, the density of its chromaticism and all kinds of varying degrees of, of difficulty in that. Um, other religious pieces, including the responses, which of which there was only the one for Easter that she premiered in Rouen in 1965, and the others that complete the set uh, have since been published along with a lot of her other music by Delator. Um, and uh, these are pieces that are not necessarily very difficult, but were in their style starting to develop a new turn in language influences in harmony and registrations from people like Messiaen were becoming very apparent. And as I've said many times, it would have been very interesting to see where that direction might have headed had she lived longer, but throat cancer got her before she turned 50 and we, we don't have that. But what at 70, 75, would her music have sounded like if she was uh, really coming into something of her own with pieces like this is always, always a question, but the diversity and the individuality there that is anything but the warmed over to pray that some people like to say her style is, um, that's, as I've said, not true at all. And there's a whole gamut of style and difficulty and, and intention. Now, the diversity is really quite vast for the relatively small amount of organ pieces that she did. Well, thank you so much. And you mentioned the seven meditations. And I know that we have an excerpt that, that we're going to hear from that that features just beautiful imagery of Santa Esprit, which is the church where she spent so much of her, of her life and so many years playing. Can you just say a, a word about the, the piece that we're going to hear, the Veni Sancta? Yes, uh, it's, the, it's the first of uh, uh, seven meditations that are based on, um, and I have my notes from Francois Zabatier here, hence my, my new glasses. Uh, these are taken from the program book for both uh, my complete works recording for Aeolus and also it's in the program book of Dupre and uh, Demencia that St. Thomas so wonderfully put together for these two cycles. Um, mm -hmm. These different correspond to the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, fortitude, piety, and the fear of God. So very heavy, weighty Catholic uh, uh, imagery going on here. And this is based on the chant of Veni Sancti Spiritus, and it's the first movement of the set. Thank you. We won't have time to hear the whole thing, but we'll hear a few moments and we can share the link for the full, full recording.
Thank you for sharing that with us, Stephen, and those wonderful images of, of Saint Esprit. Um, as we were preparing for this, you mentioned something quite interesting about the markings that, that you have found in Demasu's own scores and manuscripts versus what we see in her published music. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, we can't, sorry, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, I had the Thank mute. You. I had some sorry. sirens, but I didn't went over the music, I, I muted. Um, it, it, this stems from having met Pierre Labrique, one of her uh, uh, formidable students um, who had started in Dupre's class and then continued his own studies with her. And uh, at 100 years old this year is, is the, the oldest uh, living uh, remaining link to, to that time, uh, someone who was present, for example, when she premiered the Etudes. And he talked a lot about her performing style of her own music. And you know, certain of these that are very virtuosic, it's obviously that's the point with music like the etudes, but with music like the movement you just shared, for example, and, and, and some of the others, it turned out according to Pierre Labrique that her intention was really to make sure how the counterpoint unfolded, how the harmonic movement was structured was really at the forefront of what she wanted the listener to grasp much more than anything about her virtuosity. So uh, in the end, the metronome markings would be one thing in the score, but when she performed, they were often much slower. Uh, so in, I think that's something to realize as more people discover these published scores and more recordings and so forth, um, that her style of playing is, is all we know from the, the recordings of Franck and Liszt and so forth, which is very energetic and driven and, and rhythmic. And it wasn't always the case when she played her own music. And it turns out that was true not only of organ works. If she were the, was the pianist for uh, something in a chamber ensemble that she, she simply copied out unpublished parts for, for uh, other musicians and played, everything was often much more restrained. Mm -hmm. And I had an interesting insight to, to someone whose temperament we only guess from what we, we have heard, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the case in her own music when the music's goal was not her virtuosity. I found mm -hmm. that rather fascinating to oh, learn. Yes, yes, that is <laughs> and something that, yes, that we can't know without having those resources and access to those sources, and, primary sources. Indeed. So because of their initial relationship as professor and student, we can, can know that certainly Dupre did exert an influence on Demasu, at least in her early music and, and helped shape her career. But I'm wondering if we can talk about any influence that went the other direction, if she may have exerted any musical influences on, on Dupre's music. That's an interesting question. Um... It's hard to say, I, his style certainly, and Jeremy will want to add to this too, I think it's fair to say became uh, sometimes increasingly chromatic uh, as did hers, whether one was influencing the other is another question. Um, I, I wouldn't say necessarily that Dupre's later music was influenced at the time by the same other people such as Messiaen, the way you can see those influences in Demis's later music. Um, and all of the models, the, you know, composing for the liturgy and uh, composing choral works, which Demis did as well, um, you know, they were modeled on things Dupre had already kind of done before. And, and it doesn't really seem that he was doing anything markedly different because of something she had initiated. But uh, that is an interesting uh, question when it comes to just the density of, of some of the writing. Um, yeah, I mean, I would. I wouldn't be so sure that the influence worked that way. I think he he was overawed by her ability and her talents um, and was obviously inspired himself to try and create <coughs> something that perhaps she couldn't play. Um, but I think, you know, Stephen's talked about the motivic organisation of her music. And I, I have little doubt that that came from somebody like Dupre. I mean, the, that constructivist approach is very much Dupre taking small, sometimes aphoristic cells of music um, and often not actually developing it, but actually juxtaposing it with other cells of material and the whole facade being built on, on this accumulation of motifs um, or energy derived from that motivic repetition. Um, that you can see in so much music of the period. I mean, it's not it's not unique to Dupre, it's, it's very much the aesthetic of the time and 
you only have to look at Stravinsky to, to, to see where, where that really um, was a catalyst. Um, and I have no doubt that Dupre was, was himself influenced hugely by in the teens of the 20th century, uh, what was happening in Bohemian <laughs> Paris uh, musically at the time, which extended the language in terms of organ music so much beyond that which he'd inherited, the, the Lemons, Brandt, Vidor, um, stylistic worlds um, on which he built, but I think far more prevalent became this um, much more laissez uh, oriented uh, aesthetic um, that you can see kind of started with Stravinsky um, and, uh, and, and certainly to a degree, the second Viennese school in, in Germany, it was about that melting, that musical melting pot was something that influenced Dupre hugely. And I, I've, I have little doubt that he passed that on to Jean de Messieu as he passed it on to a number of his other students. I mean, you can see it in Messiaen. And Messiaen, we know, revered Dupre hugely. Um, and I suspect that some of that went, went towards Messiaen, Longley, Alain, um, Littes, uh, Grunewald. They all inherited that kind of way of constructing material based on a very um, strong contrapuntal integrity but that, that use of motifs and accumulation of energy from motivic repetition, uh, which you see as a characteristic in all this music, I think in, in the organ world was, was something that probably Dupre uh, initiated. I, I would, I, I would, I would have her anyway. Mm. Yes. Just talking about uh, broader senses of their influence internationally, this question is for both of you. Can you say a bit about how each of them through their work Strengthen, strengthened this uh, French-American organ connection and interest in America in French organ literature and, and in the organ in general during their lifetimes? Well, of course, I mean, I would say it was, it, you know, <laughs> we know that people like Rachmaninoff, um, who was the premier pianist of his, of his age, and Dupre as the premier organist, they became wealthy men, seriously wealthy men, because of the American dollar. And Alexander Russell, of the organist at Princeton, um, you know, never fought shy of, 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 um, of developing uh, careers um, and seeing a fast buck when it was presented to him in this, <laughs> in this way. And from, of course, 1920, 21, when Dupre first came to the US, the, that voracious appetite developed um, for Dupre's playing uh, to the degree that, of course, he was, he was in America sometimes for six months, up to six months of a year traversing across by train um, from you know, Dallas to St. Louis to, um, to Chicago to LA and so on and playing. Um, he, couldn't, he couldn't fit the number of concerts in where, where there, was, there was demand. And of course, his influence therefore spread hugely during that decade, 1920 to 1930. Um, and as the, the premier organist of his generation, it's natural, I think, that people would um, see uh, Paris as the, the natural honeypot to which uh, one wanted to be attracted. Um, perhaps Americans had the dollars to do it, to travel. Dupre saw the opportunity, Alexander Russell saw the opportunity and having his summer schools at Meudon to which American organists flocked and then the development of the American Conservatory at Fontainebleau um, meant that a whole generation of American organists uh, went to Dupre to study, to receive the pearls of wisdom from, from the master. But of course, uh, it, it also meant that the invitations were, were myriad for him to come and, and, and play back here. Um, and he, I think he was the one who eventually stopped it. He said, look, I can't be away from Paris that much. <laughs> um, those 10 years made him a very wealthy man. And of course, we, we, I've never found evidence personally, but, but there's a lot of hearsay that Dupre was, was offered positions in America, but could never quite sign on the dotted line to move here um, because he couldn't leave the organ of Saint Sulpice. That was his touchstone. So, of course, Rachmaninoff, through other different political circumstances, did come here to live. Um, and, and we know full well through the 20, 30 years that, that Rachmaninoff lived here, he mourned the fact that he was. Um, consumed by a playing career when what he really wanted to do was to write and, and his, his compositional life always, always took a back seat and that was something that he always mourned. Um, so, uh, it, and it's interesting that Dupre and Rachmaninoff, of course, were, were the last of those um, touring virtuosi 
uh, where live music was the was the way you received your music uh, that we didn't get it all through electronic media they were at the the the, the vanguard of, of the recording industry in the 1920s and 1930s and of course were some of the first to to really record extensively uh, huge tracts of repertoire uh, but in those days of course playing to thousands of people because thousands wanted to hear live music. They, they couldn't buy the LP and throw it on or the cassette or the CD or the download or whatever. Um, live music was the way you, 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 you received your music. And, and, and as a result, as I say, Rachmaninoff and Dupre became wealthy men. And I think Dupre's influence in America was, 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 was huge in those first 10 years. And that led on to a uh, a strong trail of, of, of American organists studying with him over the next 30 years in the summers. Thank you. And, and Stephen, can you, can you add anything in the subsequent decades that Demacy spent with, with her tours and what influence she might have exerted on the American audiences? Well, like Dupre, uh, who taught her, the, as I mentioned, the model, of course, um, a lot of this music that uh, you know Dupre had not finished writing, she had not finished writing, and and without, as Jeremy points out, phonograph records, you were hearing these people bring their music to the U.S. Uh, to audiences where the audiences here experience them for the very first time. Um, it's the school after uh, Vidor Bjorn and so forth, out of which this comes, but but. Bjorn, even when he toured in the U.S., wasn't doing so on the scale that Dupre was. So that that all of this repertoire was really being served up here for the first time by these, by these two uh, organists. It was sort of a first. Um, <clears throat> and something that's extremely important historically, and when we had our article uh, about all of this in the New York Times, uh, one of the questions that spawned a little of what was, was printed was, why in the area that we are now, do we look at it at someone who was in fact a little bit forgotten and you know, is it important for us to remember someone like Demisier for any reason? Well, we probably can say yes to that, but more so in hindsight now for a very obvious reason is that every career of stature and respect in the organ world internationally that any woman has been able to have in the last half century was spawned and laid, groundwork laid by Demisio because she really did it on that scale first. Um, arguably because Dupre was pulling strings, she could maybe get away with some things that a woman then in France politically uh, wasn't otherwise getting away with and that let her climb uh, to some higher heights. And we had, of course, you know, Nadia Boulanger and her teaching and her performing in the US. Uh, you think of Aaron Copeland finishing his studies with her and then in 1924 writing an organ symphony that she brought to the US and, and premiered. Um, but it wasn't on the scale of someone like Dupre and that really after the war was, was really only matched internationally by, by the stature of her repertoire and the more than 700 concerts that she played, you have to remember we're talking someone who memorized 2,500 some pieces of organ literature. How many people on one count in the last half a century can you say that about? Um, and so to, to be sort of launched at that level to begin with, and as a woman in the middle of the century after the war, to start pulling the strings to uh, tour all over Europe, tour all over the US was an unprecedented and massive thing. And uh, of course, along comes Marie-Claire Alain later and Madame Durifle and Dame Gillian Weir and a whole slew of Americans for whom their stature as a career was on equal par with any organist. But for a woman to do it, Demisio laid it out first. And that is extremely historically important for her as a figure because of the ramifications that her career uh, had that made it possible and, and surely changed a direction um, historically for the last 50 some years. I think that's really important to remember about her. Yes, thank you. I fully agree that that kind of representation at that level is so important. And I'm, I'm so grateful that we have a figure like Sean Demisio to, to look to. Yeah. Um, as we're starting to draw towards the end of our time, I have, I'm not gonna ask you each for your favorite piece because I feel like that's a really unfair question with such wonderful composers. But I do wanna ask what piece would you recommend to an organist who is looking for their first, their first piece of Dupre to learn, their first piece of Demisu to learn as an entry point into that repertoire? Um, well, uh, Dupre, as I said, is right at the top, that he was such a magpie, such a chameleon in some ways musically. 
um, and turned his hand to so many different styles, it is very difficult to pick one work that is representative. Um, and of course, in, in terms of this music, uh, one has to decide on what technical level you're going to start. <laughs> Let's uh, say for a student, if you're recommending a piece to a student or something that someone might want to learn without a devoting a year to the to the new piece <laughs> well i mean you know dupre was was a, was, a, was a fantastic i mean he always had a pedagogical sort of instinct and and you know the 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 chorales of his 28 the 79 choral which he wrote on a beach in Berets for his bank manager gustave augier who was an amateur organist he said i you know i i, I tried the organ book line chorale preludes but i you know i i can't get on with them they're too difficult Okay, so Dupre. So he spent the summer, you know, on the beach in Biarritz writing these one page, two page chorales, which I mean, the, the, for all the organ methods you can buy um, that take you through all the stages of early organ instruction, you cannot do better than the Dupre uh, 79 chorales, which go from really rudimentary to elementary, I'd say. I mean, there's nothing in that whole collection that is of anything of virtuoso purport. Uh, and, you know, some of those are just one page little exercises. They're not formidable, they're not daunting, they're not bewildering, but they're always beautiful, <laughs> you know. Um, and of course, Dupre being Dupre, he fingered every note and he pedaled every note. So if you're ever in any doubt about, you know, where to put your feet, literally, <laughs> Dupre will, will, will show you. Um, if one wants to move beyond, beyond that, then, the, as I say, the 24 inventions are beautiful snapshots of everything that Dupre did later. Some of them are tricky, virtuoso trickiness, but, but, but so many of them are not. And they're little exercises, just like the bark, as I say, the two-part and three-part inventions. And if you love those, you'll, you'll like these. Um, and they guide you through little intellectual um, and technical conundrums um, in, in, in such a a beautiful, elegant way, I think. Um, but they, they are a fantastic way into the Dupre aesthetic. If you're, if you're, if you're daunted by the Opus 7 Prelude and Fugue, the Vélation de Noël or Evocation, or, you know, the big major works that, that uh, many concert organists play, um, get inside the labyrinths at a much earlier stage in, with those pieces. The 79 chorales, I'd say, and the, and the Opus 50 inventions, just beautiful. Wonderful. I love your rebranding of the 79 chorales and if we can republish them with the not daunting, always beautiful headlines, <laughs> maybe we can get them performed more often. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Stephen, where do we start with Demacy? What's a good first piece um, of this collection? Jeremy said all that so elegantly that with the description kind of laid forward, uh, I would say exactly the same thing about her 12 uh, chorales that are so utilitarian for the mass. They're short. Uh, some are slightly more demanding technically, but nothing there is difficult. Um, they are brilliant examples of counterpoint and how to compose. They're wonderful examples of concision, uh, the use of a chant or fragments of a chant, and then writing the counterpoint and the harmonic development around it, but in a very straightforward and to the point sort of way where there's no, there's no wasting of any time or, or, or space in any sense. And they're not uh, so over challenging that if you have no experience with uh, what she requires in those later pieces that you wanna start with something you know you can tackle by far, start with the, the 12 uh, chorales and then a, the little Andante that Delator has just published that it's a two page um, little bit in exactly the same vein. And if you wanna dig your chops a little further without going crazy, there's uh, the Prelude and Fugue and See and also the Te Deum of which there are so many examples of recordings, I believe even her. Um, interesting little story about that is how it was uh, inspired by St. John the Divine and the Aeolian Skinner organ and the famous state trumpet stuff, uh, which she marks in the score as something to bring out in a, in a sort of solo manner and uh, there are some, some people here in New York of a generation, uh, one man, in fact, who had been a Dupre student and he's in his 90s, who heard her play. And uh, either he had asked her or was in earshot of someone at St. John the Divine when she played that piece there, um, is this work ever going to be published? And uh, while it was sort of inspired by St. John the Divine, it wasn't written for St. John the Divine. She had played it before. And her answer to his question was, oh, I haven't written it down. So this entire thing was formed or uh, a kind 
improvisation that became the same. Uh, and then after time, she incorporated ideas from organs that influenced or inspired her, in this case, St. John the Divine. And then when she finally put a pen to paper and then it became published, uh, much like some of Dupre's works, uh, the indications were there. And so that that's a little anecdote that makes a, a fun story that, you know, she was touring with this piece, but oh no, I hadn't written it down on paper. It's sort of interesting. So the chorales, the Andante venture into the the, the prelude fugue, the Te Deum. If, if you're really a glutton for punishment, you'll work your way into the etudes. I'm not saying I would ever recommend those and you'll know for yourself if you ever want to bother or not. Um, but those other pieces are great starting points. Thank you. Um, I want to take just a moment to plug a new recording and, and resource that has been released today, which is a collection of the 12 chorale preludes recorded by 12 organists all around the country as part of a Demisu Centennial tribute organized by Susan Jane Matthews, Janet Ye, and myself. So you'll, you can hear 12 organists, 12 organs all over the U.S. and these 12 chorale preludes as a, as a way to find them. And I think we, we have the link in the chat for you to check out afterwards. I also would love for you, Jeremy and Stephen, to tell us a little bit more about what is planned for this Demisu Day in 2022, where we can hear all of her pieces. Um, well, <laughs> I should let Stephen speak to this really, but yeah. to say that you know we 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 plan this year uh, to mark this year, of course, the Dupre Demisu year, um, with these twelve concerts and. Um, we were so looking forward to Stephen playing the, the Demessia in these last three Saturdays here in, at St. Thomas. But um, sadly, other circumstances worked against us at that point. But So Stephen has very graciously agreed to complete this series. Um, and he's going to uh, take his Red Bull drinks and uh, all the rest of it to get through the 22nd of January, uh, when he's going to play the complete works in one day in three separate events. Um, and uh, we'll make a, a whole day of it. So uh, starting with the morning and then we'll have some lunch. We'll, St. Thomas will provide some lunch and then Stephen will play again. And um, we're going to have a talk on Demessia and then we'll end the day with the, uh, the, the third concert. So Stephen, if you want to add anything about that, 22nd of January. Yes, that's very, very... Uh, grateful to Jeremy and to St. Thomas for uh, inviting me, first of all, to put this at the end of this incredible um, massive Dupre cycle um, to celebrate the year, but then uh, so graciously reschedule so that we can have a uh, complete cycle uh, in its entirety in, in January. And it ups the ante a little to say, well, let's just do it in one day, but that's it's actually <laughs> music that's been cooking for a while. So now in the next couple of months is just keeping on it on a low flame. And yeah. with all at St. Thomas and that all ready to go. Um, I really look forward to just, just getting into the groove and kicking the engine and, and going for it here. This is gonna be a lot of fun. So I invite anyone in the New York area or the East Coast or in the US to get to New York for this day. And if you can't, it will be live streamed as well and available all over the world. Um, we, I do have one question I see that's popped up in our Q&A section. Uh, from Mary Ellen Sutton, who's wondering if there's any connection between the cortege and litany and um, the assassination of President Kennedy, a story that her professor told her about Dupre feeling very moved to play this piece and then learning that uh, that Kennedy had, had just been assassinated. Jeremy, do you have any points oh, to verify? Is the anniversary today? Was it today that JFK, was it today or yesterday? It was November, wasn't it? Or was it, what, what, which date was it? Was it with? I don't know. Oh, two days? I think, it, it, was it today? I don't know. Uh, uh, it's certainly November 63, wasn't it? But I, I don't know which day, which day it was. Um, I don't know that story, to be absolutely honest. I don't. Um, in 63, Damien Dupre was, was, was in France. I mean, could well have, have, um, could well have played that on the, the respective Sunday um, in, uh, in saint Sulpice. Um, I think with the... the the great musical legacy for me of, of the, that infamous day um, was Herbert Howell's motivation to write the motet for death of President Kennedy, Take Mirth for Cherishing, which I think is, is Howell's at his best. Um, Herbert Howell is often uh, elevated hugely, um, some, sometimes too hugely, for, in, in my opinion. I think the best of Howell's is certainly um, 
extraordinarily wonderful. Um, uh, some of it, um, I'm not sure, is, is quite of the same quality, but but I think that that motet that he wrote in honor of President Kennedy is just simply magnificent. Um, and, and so contrapuntally beautifully worked as well. Um, he could do it if he wanted to, and he did sometimes. He did it in his early years, and he did it with that. Um, so I, that's the, the, the musical legacy that all sticks in my mind from the JFK assassination. Um, I don't know, certainly, the story of Dupre and Cortege, to be honest. All right. Well, we'll have to come back next year for a webinar on Howells and uh, make <laughs> connections there. But I want to thank you so much, for both of you, for sharing your wealth of expertise and knowledge on these two incredible composers, musicians, and for guiding us through their repertoire. And thank you to the AGO for organizing this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you. Well, I am honored to um, close us out this afternoon and uh, represent the entire Committee on Continuing Professional Education uh, and thank the three of you, Jeremy, Stephen, and Joy Lalani. Your words and your performances have been inspiring and informative. So a hearty thanks to all three of you uh, for this final event in our series. This is normally the time that we would make sure you sign up for next week's webinar, but as I just mentioned, uh, sadly, this is the final event in our Conversations for a Centenary series. We began two weeks ago uh, with Alec Whiten. We continued last Monday with Richard Wayne Dirksen, and we conclude today with this conversation. So if you missed any of those, um, the, the previous two are already archived on the AGO's website, and I know this one will be uh, very soon as well. You can access them by going to agohq.org slash webinars. And once you're on that page, if you scroll down and find the tab that says Conversations for a Centenary, you'll find links there of the webinars that will take you to a YouTube um, a recording of the webinars. So as this is the final event in the series, I also want to take a moment and acknowledge the committee. Um, I'm joined on that committee by our director, Frank Crozio, as well as Michael Bauer, David Hurd, and John Romeri. If you have ideas for future webinars or other continuing education endeavors, I know that any of us would be happy to hear from you. With that, uh, thanks to each of you for tuning in this evening. Best wishes for a happy Thanksgiving and good night. <laughs>